Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is the Little Bean and Me podcast channel. My name is Kayleen and I'm your host and today I'm bringing you another episode. Hooray! I uh, finally have some time to sit down and film and I have a lot of things to share with you today. I do have some whips. I have some finished objects. I have some new dyeing that I've done in the last month or so and just things in general that I'd like to share with you. So if you're interested in all that stuff then just stay right here. Grab a little something to drink, some tea, some coffee, water, snack and let's just get into everything. So first, I wanted to start with a life update. So if you're not interested in life update stuff, you're welcome to skip ahead to the crafting and dyeing section of the podcast, and I'll put a timestamp here for you. Um, but the rest of the summer, things have been going pretty well. Uh, we finished up summer camp. We just got back from a trip to Storyland, which was super fun uh, for us and for the kids as well. And uh, we are at the end of the summer, exhaustion, just waiting for school to start. So uh, my daughter starts school this week, and we're just very happy for the summer to be finished. Um, as you can probably hear in my voice, I'm a little bit sick. I've been sick for about a week or so. <laughs> it's just been kind of frustrating um, to have to go on vacation and be not feeling so great, but um, just kind of rolling along. Also, uh, the elephant in the room is my hair. I'm sure you are like, what have you done? You've chopped it all off, and yes, I have. Uh, it is my biannual, my every two year haircut, <laughs> um, which I'm hoping to remedy and have a haircut multiple times a year now, but um, being pregnant and being at home and nursing and doing all these things, you know, that just kind of keep you from being able to do things for yourself. I finally was able to make an appointment for myself to cut my hair before vacation, so it is out there, curly, just doing its own thing. So, um, yeah, things are good. I hope you guys are all well. And I hope that you guys did enjoy your summer. And if you started back to school already, I hope everything for you has gone smoothly. All right, so let's get into some whips and finished objects. Um, I do have a couple of finished objects for knitting. Uh, one, I'm going to put a picture here. Um, it is a pair of socks that I finished in the colorway She Is Fire. It is a colorway that I dyed up the other week for um, my last update, which was a bunch of uh, speckled gradients. So that pair of socks is sitting down at Marblehead Knits right now as a sample. Uh, but it was lovely to knit. It was so fun to finish up. And if you follow on Instagram, um, I'll put my social here on the screen for you. You would have seen the progress and finishing of the object. So those are done and in their temporary home. The next finished object I have is something that I finished over um, our vacation. So this I just finished it's a beanie that I made with some yarn that I got on vacation. It is Malabrigo Mecca yarn and is in the colorway Persia. Um, it's very deep and saturated blue tonal. It's kind of um, a deep teal with darker navy and black overtones uh, in the yarn, which is quite lovely. And I picked up a couple of skeins of this while we were away because I was in desperate need of something to do. <laughs> Um, something to stitch on. So I just whipped up a beanie um, in this yarn. I cast on 72 stitches for the brim, um, did a 2x2 two two rib, a plain rib, not a twisted rib, and then I just kind of made it up as I went along. So I did a few rows of stockinette here, and then I did a slip stitch and a texture. So it is one row is slip knit and one row is knit purl and I alternated up the beanie which like which stitches I was knitting and purling so I was knitting on the purls slipping the knits and then I was purling the slips and knitting the knits yeah, I don't know, I, I forget. I meant to write it down because I really like the texture and I'm going to do it again for the second hat. So this will be either for my son or daughter. They both have very large heads and it fits them just nice, just like a, a beanie should. Um, and I did just a plain decrease on the top. So after I finished my patterning, I did another five rows of stockinette and then I closed off the top by equally decreasing. So I started out um, every 
like it was nine stitches divided evenly so I knit seven and then decreased and then knit six and decreased knit five and decreased and in between I did a plain knit row so it ended up with this nice rounded top and then the last two rows when I decreased I did do um, two decreases in a row to close it off because I didn't want it to be too much of a point up here I just wanted it to lay flat so yeah so that is the beanie I worked on knit I knit them on size 8 for the size 8 for the brim and then a size 10 for the beanie itself which is actually um, quite nice I do like the fabric it's not too tight not too loose and it's very pretty I think the colorway is very pretty so that is that, and I got it, they were the Lika needles, Lika needles, however you say that, um, 32 inch, and I did kind of a magic loop where I just pulled the working needle out and knit in the round because it was a little bit too short to do a true magic loop. So that beanie is done. I do have spinning also to show you. So for spinning, I've been on and off with the project that I've been working on that's been on my wheel. This is the progress I have made. Um, I don't remember the last time that I showed you this progress, but I am spinning this. This is some fiber that I got from Snurb Yarn and Fiber. Uh, I got a Nest Shop update, I want to say last winter. And this yarn is coming out quite nicely. So my aim is to do a three ply. Again, I'm just spinning across the top as I normally do. And in terms of fineness, you can see here, it's pretty fine. Um, it will probably yield a fingering or sport weight three ply, I anticipate anyway. So uh, I've been knitting on and I'm knitting. I've been spinning on this on and off for the last month or so. And just taking breaks as I go along. I think I'm about halfway done through the braid. So the next thing that I've been working on is weaving. And so I'll tell you a little story. I went to the yarn shop in Salem, which is called Circle of Stitches. Um, it's I have two local yarn shops close to me, which is really great. And so I went in there looking for some knitting needles because I was going to film a tutorial for this channel on continental knitting Norwegian purling to redo a video that I've done a couple of years ago. And so they didn't have the needle size that I was looking for, they didn't have the length of cord that I was looking for, so I was like, all right, I'm just going to browse around. And I saw on the top shelf they had some looms, and I was like, ooh, I've been wanting to get a loom. So I asked her what kind they were, they were the shack flip, not shack flip, shack cricket looms, which is a rigid heddle loom. And I blame every podcaster that's been weaving lately. I blame Volin Vine Yarns. I blame the Freakish Lemon. I blame everyone, not your average knits, for getting me into weaving because everything comes out so beautifully. And I do love woven fabric. Um, I do enjoy wearing it and looking at it and touching it and feeling it more, like as much as I do love knitting. Crochet fabric, I'm kind of... I don't love it, love it, but I do like it enough to do it. So I bought a loom that day. I bought a 15 inch Cricut loom and I'll put some B-roll footage in here of the whip that's currently on my loom. Right now I took a plain DK weight yarn, so it's undyed Merino DK. There's screaming going on, I'm sorry if you can hear that. And then for my weft, I'm using a leftover skein of mold wine which was in my worsted update ever which was from last Christmas. Um, I had decommissioned some of the yarn from Marblehead Knits and so I thought well weave a scarf from this. So that is what is currently on the loom and it comes with an eight dent heddle which is good for DK worsted weight yarn depending on what kind of a weave you'd like. Um, and it really wasn't that difficult to learn. I just watched a few YouTube tutorials. I had some knowledge on how to warp a loom, um, how to use warping board or warping peg, just based on my experience as a dyer, um, and using those tools to create self-striping or gradient yarns. And so um, I cast on, I warped my loom, and within a few hours I wove this scarf. <laughs> 
So this scarf is in the Spectre Specs colorway on my Merino DK base. Excuse me while I scooch my way back here. And uh, the warp, again, was an undyed DK weight yarn. And then the weft was the Spectre Specs colorway. And I'm very proud of this. So it is not perfect. You can see my edges here are not very even. And I really was struggling to find the right tension for my weft. How tightly would I pull the strand? Like I would put the shuttle through the shed, which is the opening in the yarn. And then I would tighten the, 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 the point in the yarn where it turns and it goes into the piece. And so you try and aim for a 45 degree angle for, for the yarn in the shed so that when you beat it to the fabric, Oh no, my curtain's gonna fall. My curtain fell, oh, sorry. Um, oh, this chair is so noisy. I wish I didn't bake this chair. Um, so you aim for a 45 degree angle for your weft so that when you beat the fiber down into the, the woven piece and you use the heddle to, to pull it down, that you have enough give in your weft threads so it doesn't pull the sides in on your piece and create a really narrow piece mm -hmm. um, and it gives it room to bloom in there. So if you look at woven fabric you can see both strands here you can see the warp threads and the weft threads and you're and if you're looking to do a balanced weave you want to have an equal number of I think the term is picks which is how many threads in an inch across and threads in an inch down. And so you want to aim for something that has even tension around the edge. So you don't want to pull in too tightly, but you don't want to pull too loosely. So these are pulled in just enough. And then you can see these are a bit looser. This is very loose. So this whole piece is very wonky at the edges, but I think it looks beautiful overall. And I will wear this all winter because it's my, now my new favorite scarf. Um, and I was able to use two full skeins and it goes my wingspan. So I am five foot two inches and it goes my entire wingspan. So it is plenty long enough to be a scarf. And then I did leave a long fringe here. I just did a knot for every four threads or so on the weft. And I didn't do any hem stitching. I didn't experiment with that quite yet. But this was the first weave that I had ever done and I was so incredibly proud I posted immediately <laughs> on Instagram about it because I figured you all would like to see that as well. Um, then the next day I cast on again. I warped another scarf onto my loom and this time I used the Mimble Wimble colorway which I do have a few skeins left on my DK base. Uh, again, a white warp, so an undyed warp, and Mimble Wimble for the weft. And you can see here, I have very much improved the tensioning along the sides of my piece. So the first piece was a lot less even, and this one came out extremely even. Now this one I did a little bit of an experiment with my warp tension. So when you are warping a loom, um, a lot of projects you might do, or Beginner projects you might do suggest they use cotton because it's not flexible. And I would agree, it probably is easier to learn proper tension um, for weaving using an inflexible warp or something that's much stronger. So I think silk might be okay, linen, cotton, or some kind of blend of those things. And so using wool was a challenge because I was trying to figure out the correct tension for my warp without being too tight but being tight enough so that I had you know some blooming or some fulling that might happen when my fabric was done. So if you pull too tightly on the warp, which is what I did for this entire piece, it shrinks the overall fabric. Now this does not go fully my wingspan. This goes, it's probably this short on either side, shorter than the other scarf. So because I pulled my warp so tightly when it came off the loom, all of the spaces in between, so where you would see your warp threads going down and your weft threads going across, you can see how even this is here. 
you can see each thread you can see down and across and then in many spaces here you can pretty much only see the weft threads so the threads that go across this way you can barely make out the tiny little warp threads in between and so that's what happens when you are pulling your warp too tightly now I did this intentionally I pulled as tightly as I could each time because I wanted to see what would happen um, and I knew I would have a finished piece that I would like um, I'm debating whether I want to keep this or gift it or sell it in any case I think it's beautiful and it will get wear and use regardless but I, I think it came out much more dense than this, the first scarf that I did. And it, it's because as the warp shrank, all of the weft threads kind of compressed together. And I didn't overbeat. When you're pushing your weft threads down your warp and into the woven piece, you want to press them, but you don't want to beat them down unless you're making a rug or something extremely dense. And so I didn't overbeat this, but it was because of my tension changes that you can see here. So you can see here, this is much looser on these. And then over here, you can see that it's much tighter. You can see there's a difference in the space between the, so you can see this is a little bit loose here. And then this is extremely, extremely dense and tight. So um, it's wearable, it's soft and it's lovely but it is definitely tighter than what I would have expected. But again, intentional and something that I wanted to experiment with. Well, since another one was done, I might as well cast on another one. Um, this time, I really was like, okay, I have the hang of the warp tension. I have a hang of the weft tension. I know where I need to be in terms of my edges. And so this was the third scarf that I did, and you can see the edges look quite nice. And these are all plain weave, by the way. So every other thread is moving up or down like this. So you're getting a plain, a plain weave. And so this one I really love. And I decided to do a dark warp. So this skein here was on my Merino DK base. And you can see it's just kind of a glazed skein. You can see there's variation in tone in the yarn. And this was a dye pot soaker yarn so when I have excess dye in my pans I usually throw yarn in there to absorb it so it doesn't go down the drain and often I end up with dark gray or black or purple skein <laughs> because of the colors that I'm using so I used that for the warp and for the weft I used the colorway sister use your pain which I do have one skein left of that I'm looking at my shelf here on DK and so this colorway is purples and reds, browns, and navy. And you can see all those colors in here. There. Um, and so what the dark warp does is it gives a little bit of a gray cast to the scarf, which I think is quite lovely. My warp and weft were very evenly woven and you can feel it in the final fabric and you can see it here as well um, that my warp and weft threads look very even so you can see the little squares there's light dark light dark light dark and that is like a checkerboard and that's how your weaving should look and so I feel very accomplished with this scarf this is longer than my wingspan I have a very 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 long scarf here and I'm extremely pleased with how it came out. I feel like the weave has, was very balanced in terms of warp and weft tension. And I think the final piece is very long and luxurious and it is something that I'm considering gifting or selling. So, um, so if any of you weavers out there have any tips for me on weaving with wool, I would certainly welcome that and appreciate that in any case okay so so that is all the weaving that I have done then the last thing is dyeing and so I haven't dyed in um maybe a week and a half or two weeks uh one because it's been busy at the end of the summer and two I'm starting to prep to dye and finish up all of the Halloween boxes that were ordered um last month 
I have projects in the works. Oh, it's focusing on the, the alpaca back there. Stop focusing on the alpaca. Um, <laughs> it's focusing on the alpaca, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but I was prepping for that stuff and working on the artwork, which isn't that, but I was working on the artwork with my future sister-in-law, Maura, who's an illustrator and artist here on the North Shore of Boston. Um, and I believe I've talked about her on my podcast before, but I've been working with her on preliminary sketches and finished illustrations for these boxes. Um, that will be, the prints will be exclusive to the boxes. Uh, and there will be, I believe, three prints that will be going into each box. So very exciting, very spooky, Halloween themed, very like knitting slash Halloween, like two of my most favorite things. So our yarn and Halloween. So I've been working on that with her. And then one of those prints we're looking to develop into a bag for you guys um, as a treat this Halloween season so that you can have a little bit of spooky fiber arts art for your your yarn so um, anyway so those things have been going on kind of behind the scenes um, and then the dye work that I've been working on has been gradients so the last update that I did if you follow on Instagram you would have seen it it, ha it was um, a grouping of speckled gradients for the summer and so I'm going to show them to you now so when I'm doing speckle gradients I do them in a pair I dye up a double knit blank and then reskein them into two skeins and so I've set aside a few skeins for myself so that I can knit up samples for you but this is called dragon's flames so we have a nice bold blue fading into browns fading into orange and this is a really burnt brown brown black tone uh, so Dragon's Flames was one of them. Then I took a couple, well actually I'll show you who well, these three are. Um, so I had She is Fire, which is one that I showed you earlier in the podcast that I finished the sample socks for. Uh, this one is the Shell Cottage Gradient. So I took my original smooth gradient and created a speckled version. So this goes from dark navy to a bright ocean blue into gray and sand and it's hard to distinguish the difference in the cake but it goes from brown to gray or gray to brown I can't remember then this one is Weasley's Wizard Wheezes which is also an old favorite of mine so this goes from a burnt um, orange into light kind of like a peachy orange color and then into a purple so for this, um, it's the same tone that I used for my smooth gradient, but I made it into a speckled gradient. So in here, it's a deep, cool-toned purple. And then the last one that I did was Amretention. Now this was not originally a, a gradient. This was a speckled colorway that I translated into a gradient. So this goes from a dark black charcoal color through a muted purple and into a vibrant pink and purple. I do have several of these still available in the shop for purchase um, as of the time I'm filming this so I think there's one or two of every gradient that is left. Um, so if you're interested in those you know, you're more than welcome to come by the shop. I do have some of the Affirmations colorways left. There's a maybe one or two skeins of a few of the colors left and I believe the mini skein sets are still available so if you're in need of a nice palette a rainbow of mini skeins then certainly that might be for you you can go check it out and I will leave you links in the description box as well as in the iCard above oh this side this side this side <laughs> I always forget which side it is um so yes yeah, so that was the last dye work that I had done I have some thoughts about things that I have put in my shop so I do still have a few bars of wool wash left I moved some of the wool wash down to my local yarn shop but I did cut up some of the undersized bars as samples so those should be going out with orders um, as new orders come in I plan to send samples out of the wool wash so that you guys can try it um, see if you like it or if you have feedback for me I'm happy to receive it but there are a few full-size bars left they're about two and a half ounces a piece 
And let us see, what was the last thing that I was working on? Okay, so in terms of more dyeing that hasn't quite gone into the shop, I have some skeins that will be headed to the shop this weekend. So I have two one-of-a-kind skeins. So these were dyed together. These were an over, not an over dye, um, a dye pot soaker. So this is a really beautiful muted pink. So a very pale ballerina pink. And it has gray undertones to it uh, based on the colors that were soaked up from the pan. So I have a couple of these that will go in the shop on Saturday, this Saturday, which is September 8th. I believe Saturday is the 8th. It's my daughter's birthday. So I will have these up for you. And then Tyler did some dyeing with me for my birthday. So earlier in the month of August was my birthday. And um, Tyler worked on some colorways for me, with me, uh, as part of a birthday gift to me. And I said to him that he could dye whatever he chose and I would just help him along the way with what to do. And so there were five colors that he dyed. Two need a little bit more work to make what he envisioned. But there are three that will end up going into the shop this weekend. So this one, so these three, nope, these two, there are four colors. One, two, three, four. Four colors. Four colors he dyed. This one is one that I dyed that will go into the shop. And these two are both inspired by World of Warcraft. Um, and these were both orcish war chiefs. And I cannot remember for the life of me which one was which, but <laughs> they were based on the Hearthstone art of these characters. I think one is Gromesh Hellscream and one is Thrall? It might be Thrall. I can't remember, um, but I, I will put it on the screen for you guys. And then there are two others. One is Anduin Win Rin, and the other one was a warlock, and I believe it was it was another orc. There were three orcs and a human. <laughs> I can't remember. So the other two need a little bit more work, but these two can go into the shop. So I'm going to put these in for Saturday. And then the last color that I'm going to put in this week is this tonal that I made. My good friend Laurie came up during the month of August with her son and her mom, and her mom, um, they live relatively local to me, they live in the same state as me, but um, she was really interested to learn how I dye yarn, and she was around while I was dyeing these colors, but she was looking for a brick red, and I said, I can dye that for you, let me just grab the skeins. And so I did take notes on this color, so it is repeatable, but I called it Brickin' Awesome. <laughs> And it's literally a nice uh, brick red color with purple undertones and brown undertones, um, some nice ashy brown and red. So, brick and awesome will also be in the shop this Saturday. And then in terms of other shop things, the the shop right now is having a sale so I'm I had put my singles on sale so simple sock and also luck sock on sale if you go to the website you can navigate right to the sales section to find maybe what you're looking for for a project so all the yarn that is single ply and also my MCN base the Lux base is on sale I think I took off a few dollars per skein so you don't even need a coupon it's already marked down for you and then that's it, I think, for dyeing news. Uh, I have plans this week to finish up those boxes for the Halloween. Those are slated to ship mid-September. Um, if you missed out on it, I might have a couple. I have to see what my dye lot quantities are going to be like because I may have enough to put a couple as ready to ship mid-September once I mail out the pre-orders. Um, if you'd be interested in that please let me know I can see what I can do there in terms of preparation but I believe I'm going to have enough for two ready to ship boxes so if you missed on the pre-order that's all right save up your pennies <laughs> for mid-September um, it's a Halloween horror box that's going to be 
going out that counts down the 13 days until Halloween, each with a Halloween or scary movie that are some of my favorites and a yarn to accompany it. It's not just a mini skein box, it is a box of minis plus 50 gram skeins and plus 100 gram skeins. So it is 600 grams total for 13 days. It is a hefty box and that's the way I wanted it to be because I wanted it to I wanted it to be equivalent to an advent calendar for Christmas. Usually advent calendars are 20 gram or 10 gram mini skeins over 24 days and I wanted to equal that in 13 days. So I bumped it up for each one and each one should be enough to coordinate a small project, maybe a small pair of socks or to add into your scrap blanket. So, um, and then the last day we'll have a full 100 gram skein based on the movie for Halloween. Movies are a surprise, packaging is a surprise, the colorways are a surprise, and so if you miss the pre-order it's okay. I think I will have enough for two ready to ship boxes, but um, please stay tuned to my Instagram for that because that is where I will announce it and that is where if they do end up going on sale that I'll say it first before I post it so that if it's something you're really interested in, it is a little bit pricey, but if you want to get in on and not in, 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 in on it, then you should be able to do that. Um, okay, and then so other things that I've been doing and working on. So I've been reading a bit lately. I was really looking for some books to read. Um, I feel a little bit drained because it's the end of the summer. I have felt a very lack of inspiration, so to speak, where my energy is really low. I've also been under the weather. You know, I just need something to kind of rejuvenate my mind, feel better. So uh, before we went on vacation, we were picking things up for the kids, so toys and other things, and we went to the bookstore because we wanted to pick up some a gift card and then some books for the kids and I said oh I really want to look for books for myself now I have not read a good book in a very long time and so I was looking for something you know that would be easy for me to read and something that would be relaxing for me so I picked up a couple of books here now the first one I'm going to share with you is this book this is by Cormac McCarthy and it's called The Road this was made into a movie in 2009 I believe is when it was released um, but this is kind of a post-apocalyptic book that is, you know, I'm not going to say it's poorly written, but it's meant to chronicle the journey of a father and a son along the road after the world has died, pretty much. Um, they are one of very few people who are still alive, and they encounter several people along the way. There's quite a bit of symbolism in here, um, and it's 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 moving, but to me it was very, very easy to read. I read it in, I want to say, three hours. I'm a very fast reader. This is about almost 300 pages, um, but it's not a difficult read at all. If you're into post-apocalyptic things, or if you've seen the movie and you're interested in the book, I recommend it. It's pretty good. Um, there were a few things that bothered me, and I don't know if you can see here in the book, but this is a conversation. There is pretty much no punctuation in this book. Um, I'm not sure if it was, a, it's just a stylistic choice from this author. I've never read anything else by Cormac McCarthy, but the, so I'm going to read you a sentence. This is what happens through most of the book. Behind them came wagons drawn by slaves and harness and plot piled with goods of war, and after that the women, perhaps a dozen in number, some of them pregnant, and lastly a supplementary consort of catamites, ill-clothed against the cold and fitted in dog collars and yoked each to each. That's a sentence. So there's a lot of, like, run-on thought sentences where it's just, uh, you know, it's a train of thought for the dad or, or, you know, what's going on in his head, but it's just kind of... There's a lot of that. It, it makes it not difficult. To me, it makes it irritating to read because I'm such a punctuation, like, oh, I need that. But um, the message is there. For me, the writing wasn't as strong as I would have hoped it to be. It's compelling. It's a beautiful descriptors. There's beautiful descriptors, beautiful scenery. And, you know, the, the main plot line for the story is also moving. So I don't know. I, I mean, I guess I would give it like a 50-50. You might like it, you might not. 
it's not hard to read. It's, you know, if you like it, you do. If you don't, it's no, no big deal. I didn't even break the binding in this book. <laughs> I could return it if I really wanted to. Um, but that was that. So that was the first thing I was recommended. And I'm kind of okay about it. So the second book that I got was Ken Follett. So I love Ken Follett. I read The Pillars of the Earth several times over. I have not yet read the second book in this series, but it's been a very long time since I've actually read. Um, and so I am about 115 pages in to this. Now this is in the Kingsbridge series, so if any of you guys uh, have read the Pillars of the Earth, it chronicles the building of the Kingsbridge Cathedral in England, and it's pretty much historical fiction with some romance and adventure and things thrown in there as well, and he really tries to be true to the time period and also to be well researched and I really appreciate that. I enjoy his style of writing um, and it's a pretty captivating book. So far I feel even though I haven't read the second in the series which is called World Without End. Um, so Pillars of the Earth takes place medieval um, times and then this book takes place in England during the um, war with France and also as Protestantis Protestantism <laughs> is taking over France and Queen Elizabeth was going to become queen so Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth and like that whole entire thing um like before like when Puritanism was coming into play and all that stuff so um Column of Fire very good highly recommend so far I you know I think I'm like this far into the book. It's not a difficult read, it's just a long book and it's quite heavy. It's 900 pages and it's very large so it's an odd sized book. The Pillars of the Earth was a regular paperback size so I don't know what I would prefer more. So if you like historical fiction, you like Ken Follett, or if you've never read Ken Follett and you like historical fiction, you might like Pillars of the Earth or his second book as well, but I definitely recommend that book. All right, and then the last thing I worked on <laughs> since last time I podcasted was this uh, little little friend in the back here. Um, so I had an idea for a piece of art, and so this is a combination of a digital photograph, uh, which was the inspiration photo or the base for my sketch, and a sketch that I did. So I did a sketch of this a llama <laughs> and um, what oh you can see me in there <laughs> that's weird uh, I'm trying to get it so it's not so glared there we go so I did a sketch of this llama in colored pencil and you can see that you know there's colored pencil in here but I overlaid scanned the sketch overlaid it with the actual photo so that it looks more photorealistic and <laughs> I thought it came out so cute. So um, I was thinking about putting this llama guy on a bag or something like that for myself. Well, but I printed him out so I could have him on my wall. But I find him very unique. So he's a rainbow llama. And he has, you know, pretty much all the colors of the rainbow. And I brought it in also on the details of his face. And so you get the intricacies of the pencil sketch and also the photograph that was used as the basis for the sketch behind it. So, so you get like the nice shading and the photorealism in certain parts of his face, but you can see his hair is, you know, sketched, which is really kind of cool. So yeah, so I worked on this as well. I was very happy with it. He's like my little mascot now, and he sits at my desk. He keeps me company. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, pretty much that is it for me. I am so wiped out, but I do plan to do some dyeing outside of the Halloween boxes this week. I do want to get up some fall colors into the shop for you guys. I wanted to do my tree series. So Elder Tree, Wigan Tree, and um, Whomping Willow. Uh, those three I have not dyed in a series in a year and a half so I really just want to get them done and out to you so be on the lookout for that 
Um, and if you guys have any preference on weights that you'd like to see coming for the fall, as always, I'm going to die on my everyday sock base, which is pretty much the most versatile base that I die on. You can use it for anything, but I also enjoy dying on DK or bulky or worsted or whatever you like to see. So if there are certain bases that you'd like to see roll into the shop for the winter, please let me know in the comment section down below, or you can send me a PM on Instagram or an email um, through my website. So anyway, I hope you guys all have a wonderful week. Uh, enjoy your holiday. Tomorrow's Labor Day. Have a cookout. Enjoy your time with friends and family before school starts. And if school's already started for you, keep on trucking. <laughs> yeah. um, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!